So when we load pigs, um, we're today we're loading roughly 160, 162 pigs to a trailer is uh, where we're at. Um, and it takes us, you know, just if we pre-sort everything, so it's going to take us a half an hour to load them if everything goes good. And, you know, you're going to load four or five pigs. You're going to, the way we do it is we have the pigs pre-sorted and I have somebody that is running the pigs up the alley. Sawyer's getting pigs out of the pen. Somebody's running up the alley, bringing them to me and I'm loading them. And dad yells out the numbers. And yeah, and as we go, the you know, most of these guys... He relays it back to the guy running up the alley, and then he relays yeah. it back to they me. They want to know... I know how many pigs I need to get out right. to fill the hole. Right, and I like loading them because I want every pig to know as it goes on the trailer that I won, because it is a battle of <laughs> Sometimes wits. Sometimes you do lose, though. Yeah, we do. Don't get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you twisted. what. I'll tell you what. I, I'm starting to show my age because I've been knocked down twice in the last year, and... I loaded last winter and I actually had my legs, my short little legs. I'm pretty sure if you would have seen it in slow motion, my little legs were above my head. And it was one of those deals that when I hit the ground, I sat there and I thought to myself, I wonder if you're going to be able to get up or not. I wonder if you've broke anything. All of the food we eat and much of the clothing we wear comes from plants and animals that are raised on farms. Farms are different in type, in size, and even in name. Welcome to Barn Talk. What happens at the barn stays in the barn until now. We're going to let it all out for you guys. Today, we're joined with a special guest. We'll introduce him a little later, but today we're going to get into the logistics of ag, how we get the pork to you, the consumer, from the little pigs to fat hogs to get them on the truck to get them to the packers. All that's going to get broken down for you guys and he's he knows his stuff. He knows everything that goes into this business, trucking and everything. So you'll get a lot of value out of this. A lot of people have questions. Uh, we get asked a lot of questions about that side of it. And we figured it'd be good to just have somebody on there that's an expert. So without further ado, do you want to give a market update, Pops? I guess I can. <laughs> Markets are all headed in the shitter because <laughs> harvest is on. I'd say we're... I don't know. I asked the feed truck driver yesterday whether... Uh, whether there was any new crop corn rolling into Wayland, and he said he didn't think there was, but um, I'm sure the first truck that goes, the basis falls out. So um, there's a few guys starting around here, and I've heard pretty good numbers. Uh, I talked to a guy the other day, or two days ago, that was combining his corn was between 21 and 23. I went out and hand-shelled some, and it was 25, and so add a few points to that. I don't think mine's quite ready yet. Um, but we'll probably go next week because why not? It's it's hot, so we'll let the we'll just blow air You're on it, see if we can get it dry. You're getting antsy. Well, you know, when you got as many acres to roll as we got, <laughs> you gotta get you gotta get after it. Or we'll be picking corn in the snow. Well, not really. Well, actually, we could with as much shit as we break. So, anyway, uh, local corn five sixty, and that's at one of the feeders five eighty three in Muscatine. Soybeans twelve fifty four on this side of the river and 1290 if you want to go across the river i forgot to take cattle out of the thing i was going to quit even talking about cattle because cattle is 124 every week i mean they're just high wish i had some uh, oh whoa that's a that's i know i'm kidding I'd ever hear those words i don't want i don't want any cattle i don't yeah I was uh, gonna say. if there's something that could bring the cattle market down it would be us getting into cattle probably, <laughs> probably. that would do it that would do it hogs uh the closest month's 82 just shy 82 when i looked bitcoin forty-eight thousand. it's on its way back it's kind of been it it hit the skids right there the day that uh el salvador, el salvador started up but yeah. it's coming back uh to the moon <laughs> ethereum 3500 tesla's having an up day 752 the last time i checked so we're all headed in the right direction. I want to say one quick thing. If you guys get any value from the show today, all we ask for you to do is just share it out. Share the show with your friends, family, coworkers, whoever. Uh, that's just the ticket admission to watch or listen to the show. We don't run ads on the show. We don't promote the show with ads. So it's all just organic growth. And that's all we ask from you guys if you enjoy it or anything. So. Yeah, and, and comment. 
and tell us what you really think. I had a great, we had a great comment off the one last week. So last week's podcast was an hour and 50 minutes long. And somebody, somebody said, well, you wanted me to be honest. Uh, I really liked it. And I did listen to it all the way to the end. I'm surprised I did, but, uh, an hour and 50 minutes, that's pretty long. You guys need to keep it down to an hey, hour. Hey, you don't have to listen to it all in one day. You know, you can break it up. But that's kind of the that's the point of a podcast. We get real deep in the conversation. So well, sometimes get, when it's just flowing, we're going to let it flow. That's something right. like that. We get we get going. Sometimes we can't Leave stop, us a review, too. Leave us a review. Yeah. All the reviews that helps. helps. That really helps us out. So, yeah, all right. Go ahead. Pops. Okay. Well, today, we've got, we've got a... Uh, local legend. So Austin Nupp is the transportation director of Eichelberger Farms, which, uh, full disclosure, that's who we feed pigs for. And uh, he is a Southeast Iowa guy, grew up here in Southeast Iowa. He is uh, involved in his family farm and trucking business, which he still finds time to drive for. I don't know. I think he just sleeps at his desk down there at the truck shop, but I won't tell anybody. Ah, oh, shit. I just did. <laughs> did. Uh, he is a graduate of Iowa State University and a degree. What is your degree? Uh, ag slack. A- ag studies. Ag, ag studies. Ag studies. Well, I, I was going for two and a half years, so I wanted to elongate my stay. So I had three minors and sciag biz agronomy. So look at you. Yeah. You, half my resume is, is that. Yeah. But you go get her. I did. I, th- I thoroughly enjoyed my four years. And Nup knows how to work a room. And let's face it, he's a borderline genius because at the end of the day, he's a truck driver. And we all know those guys, they they know know it all. They know all the answers. So welcome Austin Nup. Okay. So today you're the transportation director, but you're still farming. Mm -hmm. You're still trucking on your own. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about how... You got to this mess. Growing you know, up in growing up in Southeast Iowa, growing uh, up a farm kid. So yeah, I, I am in the heart of Washington County, which uh, Washington County is very known for its uh, success and economy in the ag world, especially hogs, corn, soybeans, a little bit of cattle, not so much anymore cattle. But uh, I'm right in the heart of Washington County. Grew up in Highway One, State Highway, a little small small row crop operation. Um, my my uncle Mark kind of runs that side of the thing. Uh, or the business. My, my father, you know, when he was that age back in the, oh, you know, 70s, um, he, we weren't the size that he could come home, so he needed to have supplemental income. So he started trucking um, to, to branch style out. The trucking was 100% his, and kind of Mark took over the, the farming side of things. Um, so kind of f- fell in love with that, just as any other farm kid, just like Sawyer did when he was young. Um, really took an interest in the farming thing, uh, and later into the trucking. Um, uh, more so, the trucking later because of income. You know, when I kind of got old enough, the, the markets weren't where they needed to be to yep. come home, right? LDP and corn. Yep, exactly. So, um, you know, even growing up, uh, you know, my first memory of, of actually having a good responsibility on the farm um, would have been uh, we used to do our own pigs. So dad and Mark would do the chores and me holding the needles of the medicine would have been some of my first on the swine side, but then even the row crop, driving the 4020 or the hand uh, – the 730 John Deere or the 77 AD at Oliver, uh, one of those two, and pulling hay bales. You know, that was kind of my first responsibility um, going way back when. And it's a fond memory because that's kind of where it started. Um, Then obviously through, you know, 4-H when I was 10 in fourth grade and then FFA being very involved and uh, being able to hold three offices in my 4-H club and three offices in my my FFA career and uh, and then carrying into the Iowa, Iowa degree. Um, with an FFA and the American degree as well. And then that transferred into Iowa State. And, uh, you know, Iowa State was uh, uh, one of the best four years of my life. And more so, not what I learned, but the experience I had, the university I was. <laughs> it was just, it yeah, was, yeah, the experience, yeah, the, the experience. experience. The people I met, the, the uh, it just thoroughly enjoyed yeah. every minute of it. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough, the people I met, all my best, yep. everyone in my wedding was Iowa State, and not not a knock on the people I met in high school, but you really, high school brought you together with your extracurriculars, all right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And But college, really, you're there in the same degree. It's a passion. So the, yep. the farming, the the animal, the animal science guys, that was all passion, and you, you share that same interest and really gets you on a deeper level of relationship, in my opinion. Yep. 
so well. And then graduated and then came home um, to farm and truck. Well, corn was, this had been in, uh, in 16, you know, corn was three and a half bucks, beans yeah. were eight seventy five, and there's just not a lot of. And know, land's expensive. Yeah, land's expensive. So, you know, supplemental income, I had to do something different. And that's really where I kind of jumped full full force into the trucking, having that supplemental income. Yeah. Um, because we didn't have one, the money to pay me a full wage. And then two, you know, there was odds and ends throughout the year to be able to, to keep, stay busy, but, um, it's just, just not enough. Um, and then I met my wife, uh, in June of 16. And then I kind of right away knew this was probably a pretty good opportunity. Um, so I had to, uh, you know, decide do I have that trucking lifestyle, which ain't an eight to five yeah, not right. every day. So, um, I had to make a decision and then, it would have been October of 16, uh, November of 16, somewhere in there. I had a couple messages. Um, the individual that was in charge of my position at Eichel Burgers um, was kind of near in retirement and uh, heard oh, yeah, three or four people saying, hey, here it is, here it is. I'm like, well, you know, what, what, why not? You know, yep. so yeah, still my first mindset was I can still take a step back from trucking or, or farming, but then have a, still be involved in that industry I love, right? Yep. In the animal science, I'm still involved in the trucking and I'm more of an analytical guy and a numbers guy and being able to, uh, to, to schedule all those things. And it's more of a challenge too. Yeah. Um, so it kind of fit me, my realm, my personality and, and my, my passion as well, but also knowing that I needed to slow down if I wanted to have a successful potential marriage. Yeah. Um, right. And I was, as a kid, I, I, wanted, I always wanted to coach T-ball or coach football, that sort of thing. Yep. So being having having to truck and do that would not mix not right. jive. not near as much flexibility absolutely yeah so you know you tell you talking about your your dad and your uncle that reminded me you know the well it reminded me of how old i am because so i have fond memories of loading your grandpa's straight truck because we used to sell a lot of hogs to oscar meyer uh, when it had the buying station where High V is, or go to Rath in Columbus Junction, yeah. and we would. Did they have one or two? Rath had it. No, your grand when your when your grandpa and your dad and uncle when they first started, did they have one or two of those straight trucks? They had uh, two. So we had the red one. Yeah, and then we had the green box, yeah. and we sold the green box <laughs> at this auction. Oh, I've been. 10, 15 years ago. And the, whoever bought, I think it was on my Fairfield, I want to say, or Pleasant Plain. And they still use it every now and then. Oh, but we darn. still got the 70, I think it's 72 Chevy. Yeah. We still got it running around. Yeah. So we would, we would, the way our hog operation worked is we would, we would sell hogs on Monday and we'd sell 50. Or if we were really ambitious, we'd sell 100 because I think you could put 50 on that straight truck. Is that right? I that sound tell. right? That was before my time. Because it was double decked. Mm -hmm. I think you could put 50 on there. So we'd sell 50. Then we'd move pigs from the grower to the finisher, from the nursery to the grower. Then we'd wean as many sows as we could to get enough crates. Then we would go over to the sow barn, to the gestation barn, and we'd start grabbing tits to see if there were any of them that were going to like farrow that day or our estimate for what was going to farrow that week. Then we'd wash that many crates and then we'd do it and then the next week we'd start all over oh, yeah. Con continuous flow but the the nup the nup trucking empire was an integral part of of our of our operation Foundation. so i mean that was i was not well that was in the 70s no. well that was in the 70s so i mean you guys have been doing it for a long time but so you grew up you know you grew up with your dad trucking mm -hmm. and what was that like like, did you look at that and you, I bet you loved it when you went, like when you yeah. rode along and all that, but also the not being around all the time, not being around for this or that, did that affect you? Is that, do you think that's why you were looking for, because on the one hand you knew the truck and worked, yep. it provided you an income, but you also knew that if you were going to have a family of your own, you might not want to do that full time. Absolutely. The the passion was farming and it still is to this day. Yeah. Um, I, I'd pick farming hands over fists. Now yeah. granted, when 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 you get married, right, you have you have goals together. Right. And some of them goals, whether they're short or long term or small or mighty, you know, that also takes consistent income, right? So we go back to 
taking a job with Eichel Burgers and then still trucking. That that's cash flow because I can't just farm. Right. Fun. I mean, I bought a piece of ground, but trucking paid for right. that. Right. That my right. cash flow from that pays for that. Right. So, um, Dad was very very good about making art. I don't. I can't name an event that he didn't make of my brother and I. Right. And we were we were very involved for each FFA, four sports apiece that he didn't now granted he had drivers. Yep. So he could manage his schedule around that. Um so he he was I'll I'll say it again, very good about making every event we, we were at. Um and that's no small feat. No, no, no. But also, you know, he he he'd worked hard. He put a lot of hours in so whether it was we got back from a double header at Mount Pleasant, we get back, he's going trucking. So, um, it's, and it just takes communication within your marriage too, yep. too. So who's going to drive who, or who's going to pick them up and that sort of thing. But also knowing that at the end of the day, you got to make money too. Look at that pro tip. That is a pro tip. Yeah. Have, Getting it from the best. <laughs> Do you think that's the hardest thing about being a trucker is the, you know, have enough time for your family? You think that's the biggest struggle? truckers um, face one of the biggest struggles well when when trying to find someone a driver and and now nowadays it's just like pulling teeth um you know that's the first thing i say hey this is nights you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm gonna cut to the chase i don't want to waste your time or my time but it is a lot of nights you know and then it's not okay i'm gonna get up at 7 a.m and i leave at 7 30 i'm home at five that, that's not the way it is because any any time on the clock in a 24-hour period there's pigs loading right yep. and in a seven-day week there's only about 24 hours where they're not loading right yep. so there's you know i could have a load at midnight or we have a load at 9 a.m you know and especially in a smaller uh a smaller company you don't have the option to pick and choose right now right. if you have 30 trucks 50 trucks etc or more than that you know you have a pool of load that you can pick and choose but also you know you don't want to do that because you do that and then you send the wrong message to your other employees right and vice versa um yeah when we load because we hate loading your late we hate late loading your 2 a.m loads but i always when i am loading them i think to myself i'm gonna load this week and then i'm not gonna load again for a week or i may not load for two weeks if it's first cuts whatever yep. and i think about you guys doing that every night and mm-hmm. i'm like i don't know Man, if i can do it, that and yeah i give mad props to truckers because okay. it's it's I, I bitch because it's hard for all, we don't like doing it and you guys are doing it every freaking night and I just man you they're it's a tough breed you got to be a tough son of a gun to do it. Well, you know? there's a lot of variables in that too because you know let's just say you have one load, okay, but then your second load has a four hour gap. Well, yeah, you know, that's you the worst. Can't come home mm-hmm. right because then you're losing your fuel, losing right. your time, wear and tear on the machinery. Um, so you sit right. Well, you need to get you need to take care of don't your get- drivers for that, or you know just depending on how it is, or yep. you got to wash out. That's time. Um, and nowadays you wash out, I'm going to say upwards 90, 95% of the time to, yep. with PED and don't want to, tr- uh, and you don't want to track disease around from farm to farm. Um, and then, you know, what, what the plant breaks down, right? You know, there's so many variables in that, or if it's first cut versus second or last cut, right? right. Dump, you know, or if it's first cut, but guys like you pre-sort, well, guys will have 30 year old barns. Yeah. You can't pre-sort. They right. Got, you know, they have 18 inch alleys. You know, yeah. So you got to figure, you got to figure, you go to one place and you can load in 20 or 30 minutes and you go to another place and first cuts versus that's what you're talking about. So if, you know, a lot of places, if you're doing first cuts, you can't sort, it's going to take you every bit of an hour to load mm-hmm. that load. Minimum. And then, you know, then you got three trucks in a row. It's an hour for the first truck. Well, that truck's got to get undressed, move the truck. The next truck's yep. got to get in there, dressed. There's 15 minutes, you know, yep. so uh, it's just time management, but you can never plan ahead because there's other variables in that aspect, right? right. You just don't know. We always enjoy loading Austin's truck, though. We know you're a professional. Our, our <laughs> favorite, our favorite uh, always schedule. Yelling, always yelling, loading like butter, boys. Loading yeah. like, loading <laughs> yeah. like butter. <laughs> our favorite uh, schedule is when we get the schedule and it's 10:30, 11, 11:30, or 10, 11 midnight, and it's nup, 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 nup lands. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, shout out to Jonesy Jones. Uh, he is, he's always like a little ray of sunshine when he comes in there. <laughs> he gives the same, how you doing, Jonesy? And he just looks at you. Yeah. <laughs> so like, let's just get it done. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Right. Did you already, did you always know you wanted to go down this path? Would you read that always? Like, I know you said you're in sports and stuff like that, but was ag more, were you more passionate about ag than you were sport in sports? You know, uh, it's transition. You know, yeah. we were fortunate enough to be uh, uh, the state championships of, of baseball my senior year, junior and senior year. But senior year, you know, it's it, when you see that 
someone tells you that last ch- a chapter, it turns. You're mm-hmm. at the last page of that chapter and you're on the next one. It was, you can never express that to a kid. You know, you, you just can't until you experience mm-hmm. it, right? So I'll never forget the last pitch. And uh, we lost to Harlan. It was 7-2. And, uh, and we lost. And we were going through shaking hands. I'm like, wow, you know, this is the 28th of July. I'm supposed to go to Co to start football on the 11th. I got 10 days and it's full bore, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's where... I ask myself, I'm like, is this what I want to do, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, college sports is a lot different than high school. You know, high school is a short-term, couple months at a time. You're onto a new sport. Well, college is full bore, 24-7, a year at a time. Mm-hmm. So um, I had asked myself that, and I answered it quickly where, um, I mean, my grandpa always told me, you got to go three days with a consistent decision for it to be a quality decision. You know, That's so good advice. You, you don't want to make a rational decision because – it might be an emotional one. An emotional decision is the last thing you want to do, in my opinion. Um, so I, I actually went from state baseball, went to the Ozarks for a few days and had a couple of toddies. And I'm like, you know, I just short and long term. My vision, I was my vision guy and setting goals, and it just was not Sports. in my vision. And my goals, short and long term, didn't involve that, right? Yeah. So it was time to move on. And uh, so then I went up on the 2nd of August to Iowa State and uh, – Luckily, the guidance counselors at Washington back throughout my senior year, they said, you know what, you're probably not going to go, but just just apply. You never know. I went up there and met with Ben Chamberlain, who was later my advisor. He's like, oh, this is this is exciting. I'm happy for you. I hope, you know, we'll probably set you up and we'll, we'll start you in January. I said, no, I want to start this, this fall, yeah. which was the 20th. And so, you know, the second to 20th is 18 days. And he's just like, oh. And I'm like, yeah, I'm applied. He's like, well, this, you know, okay. And we went over the admissions. And at that time, you know, you're two and a half weeks away from starting. Yeah. So that all the busy work's already done. You know, they're just coasting till school starts. And I mm-hmm. got a room in Larch and, or Maplewell Larch, second floor Larch, and got into some bigger classes. And I already had my, my credits transferred for transcripts. It was a, it was a blessing in disguise looking back at that process. It was meant to be almost right. how smooth that process went. So you were, yeah, because you were planning on going to Co. Yeah, football and baseball. Yep. yep. And then the you decided to make the switch yep. to and go to Iowa home, State. Uh, God bless him, Coach Staker um, at Co. I called him on the way back from Ames and yeah. said, withdrew my acceptance. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And then I went up to Ames. It was, it went to the state fair. And then that Saturday night, I said goodbye to mom and dad and went to Ames. So. <laughs> Well, that I mean, it worked out though. It was. I mean, in hindsight, it would you wouldn't have wanted any any other way. No, and, and uh, I guess more to answer Sawyer's question, it was it, obviously I missed sports just like any other yeah. kid. It was a huge part of my life ever since I was in t-ball and flag football, you know, right. pre-elementary. But uh, you look back, and especially as you age, um, you look back, and and there's not a doubt in my mind where I made the right decision. Yeah. You know, um, because like I said, I talked earlier about Iowa State and the experience that I had. And the people I met, I, that wouldn't have happened if I would have went down that path. And I would have met other people and had other memories and other, other experiences that would have, would have been neat and exciting. But I'm happy with the path I took. Yeah. I totally agree with you what you said about not making emotional decisions. That's something that you don't yeah. really realize. I mean, it takes somebody to tell you that because a lot of people make emotional decisions. But that was, that was good. I like that. that yeah, was- say that one more because that... That is, I've never heard that before. You got to go three days with a consistent decision for it to be a quality decision. That's pretty good. So. Yeah. I was, if there was a bomb button, we'd drop a bomb. Right we got now. all these buttons and we've never programmed them. Yeah. Got I, these. A little side note here too. If you just saw me walk around Austin while he was talking there, I was checking the cameras because we don't have anybody up here that runs this whole deal. So I got to sometimes get up in the middle of the podcast, just make sure everything's flowing good. It's a contraption. So, and, and we've had one podcast we had to reshoot Yeah, because one of the cameras quit. It, and it was the one on the guest. Yeah, exactly. So it wasn't good. The, the, you do not want Torx or the guest camera to go out. Because. No, actually, I'd be fine because I look best on radio, but the <laughs> guest or Sawyer because they're better to look at. Okay, so you you've been so you've been at Eichelberger six years, four and a half. So four, I oh, four and a half. January sorry, first seventeen. Oh, oh yeah, that's last right. Four and a half years. Yeah, that's Man, right. It's crazy. Thank you. So about. yeah, and a lot a lot has happened because Correct. we went through COVID. Which COVID was uh, a train wreck, a train wreck, and especially logistically because you didn't know from one day to the next if the plant was going to be open. Correct. So it, it was more so from the plant side of things. Yeah. Um, you know, well, and I guess to start from the beginning, South Farms, right? So we had to make sure our our Eichelberg employees were, were healthy. 
Um, and, and we had a, a strict protocol that uh, we get from the CDC, just like any other company. Um, and then obviously drivers too, you know, yep. or even people in the shop. And then, then you go downstream, then you get to people in the office, you know, they, they have an integral part in the success of the operation as well. And then you get to the plants, you know, how we make money is we sell our pigs, we market our pigs. So each plant, you know, when there's, you know, 1,500, 1,500 people working in a plant in a small space, it's inside, um, they had their growing pains as well. So whenever they had issues, um, we had issues, right? right? We, if they don't have workers there. They can't, they can't harvest the meat and we can't get the pigs there. So people have asked me about this and, and for full disclosure, I was still involved in Eichelberger Farms when that was going on, but I felt like pure luck of the draw, one of the best things that, that we had going for us, that Eichelbergers had going for them was the fact that they actually delivered pigs to three different packers Absolutely. rather than one because there were so many people that for lack of a better phrase had all their eggs in one basket and when that happened i mean you get pigs backed up in a hurry absolutely so at that time we were in, we were hard, we were marketing to four separate facilities yeah so you know there was some that had really really good luck and there's some that had really bad luck you know so and i remember uh one of the facilities we were we sell uh quite a few loads to each week and uh and they called that Friday morning for the next week and said, "Hey, I got very good news. We're not we're not harvesting at all next week." And I'm like, oh, you're, "You're kidding?" He said, "No, at all." Yeah, which is which is a, a huge blow because it's a, a good percentage of our pigs. So you know how you know, your first thing is like, well, "What am I going to do? I need to reevaluate the schedule, yep. and then I need to get the biggest pigs out, and then also um, prepare for the next week." You know, what am right. I going to do on the short term and long term? Because if this is going to be on, gone for, or down for a week or two weeks or three. What are we going to do? Yeah. So uh, hypothetically, we had some scenarios on what we're going to do for for each sector. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that people from the outside you just don't realize is that when you have all these pigs and all these buildings, it seems like you have a lot of space and you have mm -hmm. a lot of options. I was just going to say that. But the problem is... Every day, almost every day, they're loading out pigs somewhere. And every day we're producing more... There's more pigs being produced that have to leave a sow farm because when you build a sow farm, you build it with the idea that you're going to wean pigs twice a week or three times a week or every day of the week, depending on the size of it, and those pigs are going to go to somebody's finisher. Well, that's all planned with the idea that every week people like us are going to empty a finisher and get it washed and get it ready for pigs and when covid hit and these plants started shutting down when you can't empty when you can't dump a building we can't refill that building right and so the domino it's like a domino i mean it just and they just started falling and then you have to you don't want the pigs to get too big, so we're taking out we're taking out energy, and we're feeding them shelled corn, and we're trying to slow them down, and then we're trying to find other places to send them. And I mean, I feel like I feel like the entire industry really did a an amazing job getting through that. Um, I'm sure it wasn't perfect, but like in our case. Boy, because we, we were we had one that site two site two was right in the middle of that, mm -hmm. and we had pigs. We got about half empty, and then we we had some big ass pigs. They were big <laughs> pigs, and we did end up getting them all. We ended up getting them all mm -hmm. sold. But yeah. man, it was that was a scary time. Well, that's the problem is you're you're if you're based on efficiency, those those sows are still going to wean every day, right? Yep. And then, but if you're holding back all your market animals, so that the window of opportunity shrinks, squeezes. You know, so a lot of people would would we would stock and a half our facilities our wean yep. sites well we had to double stock or we had a triple stop excuse me stock for a short period of time to get through that um and then also like i said we also had to we had big pigs you know but then you also got to be careful on the back side of things at the market you know each plant has kind of a maximum right for a carcass weight so once you get exceed that then you then you lose value yep. you know so um, it, it was a, you're right, hundred percent credit to the whole industry. You know, we, every company would have probably done something different looking hearsay, yeah. but, um, I said, Eichelberger's, uh, I thought we did a very, very good upper management team and all the way through our sow employees, everyone yeah. in between 
good communication and, and working as a team to, to get on the right path and, yeah. and most importantly do what's best for the pig yeah and we're all still we're all still in business so we did something right so far and making money we're making, making money. yeah we're, believe it or not we're making some money that's good so today what is and i i mean i we i think we touched on this a little bit but what for you when you go to work on Monday, what what do you feel like is your biggest challenge to getting to keeping all the wheels turning? Uh, partly with my kind of I'd say right and left hand with with uh, our marketing guy getting the right pigs in the right place. So we we all touched on a little bit about us marketing to three or four different facilities. Um, so with that being said, the uh, the premiums and docks are different. That that mid that that uh. Uh, how you want to market or send the right pig. So by, by weight, that, right. that, that wheelhouse of opportunity to make profit and loss or premium in docks um, is different at every packer. Yeah, you're shooting, you're trying to get the right of your inventory of the pigs you have out in the country because you've got, you've got a barn that you're just starting to sell out of, which... You don't know for sure what those pigs are going to weigh. I mean, you have a pretty good idea because you're selling the group of pigs that filled before them. Yeah, so you you kind of know. And days on feed, you know, you can kind of go off that. But you really don't know exactly till you get into them. Yep. Then you got barns that you've already taken pigs out of that you pretty much know. Okay, they ought to be about this. And then you got pigs that you're getting ready to dump that you know are going to be a very they're going to be a varied weight because you've got everything from the tail end that are at market to the pigs that aren't going to be in the window that you want that you got to decide where to go to the best place so um you know we get a schedule so as growers we get a schedule on friday for the following week so i'm assuming i talked to the marketing guy today and he's planning on coming and looking at my pigs that we have at what we call site one Mm -hmm. and chances are they're going to take what we call first cuts out of there so i'll get a schedule friday and then i'll know what day i'm going to be selling pigs and so go through how you guys start a week because you're 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 attempting to be a week ahead in other words you know when when monday comes or when sunday night comes because you start hauling pigs for that week on sunday night Mm -hmm. But you, that schedule's already pretty much set with the exception of what can go wrong because exactly. you know it can go wrong and you can have this or that. But then you're working on, the marketing department is working on where they're going to go get and how many pigs and all that. When do you get, when do you get, when does the trouble get shipped to you as far as when does the marketing department say, all right, nope, we got this many loads and then it's your job to figure out Who's going to haul them and how you're going to haul them and all that. So on uh, on Thursday, midday, early afternoon, I will get a, a, a rough draft of a schedule that I I preliminary did three weeks ago. So our marketing department will get me a list of loads. So, for example, like today I did 10-4. So, uh, well, I'm a trucker, 10-4, ironically. <laughs> but, uh, um, but, but our marketing guy, Bob Coker, he sent me 10-4. So it's a list of loads of X amount of loads, and they are by um, by flow. And then also by some of the flows we feed specific for iodine level and some yeah. other necessities at plants. Um, and I will make a schedule. And, and he'll also tell me how many pigs we would like to send per plant. So I have a, a rough draft that I, I put together and then I'll put dock times in there. And, I'll, and then I will send that to those three or four facilities. That way I can lock in those times. So then once we get that done, now we fast forward two and a half, three weeks, and then he will work on that on a Wednesday. Filling in morning. those blanks as to what buildings, what growers are going to provide yep. those loads. Yep, exactly. Okay. So then, then I will get that on Thursday, mid noon hour, somewhere midday, noon hour, and then I will start piecing it all together. So then, you know, he did it for the size of pigs, then I will do it for logistically, um, and then times, and then grower schedules, uh, turnarounds, biosecurity. Uh, iodine level, all, all those variables that come into that final format. Right. Um, and, and like I said, it's, it's, it is challenging because, you know, you want to make the most amount of money and be most efficient, but also, you know, if we got PD running around or we got PERS running around, you got to be, be mindful of 
you don't want for you know yeah i don't want to send a guy to a dirty site to load yep. and then if i can avoid it i don't want to take him and send him to get first cut somewhere yep. or, or whatever or we got growers that raise 1500 head or 1200 head barns we got guys that raise 30,000 head or 30,000 spaces right now you're right so you know if if i got pd in one place and then not the other i don't want to t- take a dirty trailer to a facility or a right. caretaker that takes care of a lot of pigs because potentially hype he could get that and then spread it, you know, so it's detrimental. Yeah. So there's just a lot of different variables that kind of go into that final draft. So on, on Friday mornings, if I, if we're, if we're combining next Friday and I'm just bored and need somebody to talk to Friday mornings, probably not the best time to call you. <laughs> I want to tell you stories. Th- Thursday afternoon through about Friday, 11 AM. It's, it's pretty wild because it's not so, you know, moving around. It's just, it's more mentality right. because you lose your train of thought. You know, it's yeah. like I have, I'm going to, I'm going to highlight this load because it's, it's too big. Right. Yeah. So I need to switch it from a one, one packer to another packer because I'm going to get more money there or, or this is PD positive and I need to make sure I have this highlighted and, and purple because, right. you know, it's just, a, it's a more of a mindset. And then if someone walks in, you know, a lot of times I'll just leave or I'll go to a little safe space and I turn my phone on silent. <laughs> because, just lock in. Yeah. You got to lock in yeah. because like you said one mistake can be a lot of money. Um, right. And, uh, and, like, and like I said, it's just a lot of moving parts to get that final draft. What do yeah. you th- What do you think is the biggest challenge as a livestock driver? What do you think the biggest challenge is for somebody that hauls pigs, cattle, you know, whatever? I think this will go along with trying to find someone to do the job. So mm-hmm. there's, you know, you could go work for a Walmart or a Amazon or a JB Hunt or something like that where it's non live freight, right? You're, you're hauling salsa or diapers or, or just mixed feed or bag feed or whatever. Compared to livestock, there's a lot of overhead, right? A lot of times you smell like manure. Uh, you're you're running at nights. Um, the, the USDA at plants uh, with, with uh, the consumers being so anal nowadays and, and social media can, can also be a negative effect where they're pushing these things and there's so many requirements and PETA and animal welfare. And so you have eyes on you anytime you're at the plant um, and all those variable biosecurity, you gotta have, you know, you gotta have boots on, you gotta shower and shower to some facilities. So all that excess compared to going to another, you know, non-live carrier is, it's hard, right? Right. And that's the first thing also with, with not why well, I was talking about hiring people. I say, do you want to do nights? But also it's this, you know, you yep. want to be blunt because the last thing I want to do is hire someone and they're, they're not going to follow the biosecurity rules. Right. You know, we, they, we lose a lot of money because we broke a farm or we broke a, a site. And then I look back, you know, we have to be very blunt and transparent from the start uh, right. or we're going to go backwards. Yeah. And I, I feel like these truckers don't get enough credit because... And I don't think most people, if you're not within the industry, you don't have any idea. So when we load pigs, um, we're today we're loading roughly 160, 162 pigs to a trailer is uh, where we're at. Um, and it takes us, you know, just if we pre-sort everything, so it's going to take us a half an hour to load them if everything goes good. And, you know, you're going to load four or five pigs you're going to, the way we do it is we have the pigs pre-sorted and I have somebody that is running the pigs up the alley. Sawyer's getting pigs out of the pen. Somebody's running up the alley, bringing them to me and I'm loading them. <laughs> and dad yells out the numbers. And yeah. And as we go, the, you know, most of these guys it back to the guy running up the alley and then he relays yeah, it back to they me. They want to know, if, know how many pigs I need to get out right. to fill the hole. Right. And I like loading them because I want every pig to know as it goes on the trailer that I won. Because it is a battle of Sometimes wits. Sometimes you do lose, though. Yeah, we do. Don't get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, Don't I'll tell you twisted. what. I'll tell you what. I, I'm starting to show my age because I've been knocked down twice in the last year. And I loaded last winter. <laughs> and I actually had my legs, my short little legs. I'm pretty sure if you would have seen it in slow motion, my little legs were above my head. And it was one of those deals that when I hit the ground, I sat there and I thought to myself, <laughs> I wonder if you're going to be able to get up or not. I wonder <laughs> if you broke anything. And I didn't. I felt, I felt it afterwards. But what I'm, what I, my point to that rambling is um, we load those pigs on that trailer and we've got sorting panels and um, rattle paddles and we do have hot shots, electric prods, um, because you can you and we use them we only use them if we have to and we use them very sparingly and there's there's and the guidelines thing. on how you do that but we put those pigs on a trailer and obviously that trailer is full 
And when they get to the plant and they have to unload those pigs, they, those pigs, that's unfamiliar territory. And they're, they're all riled up and they've ridden for three hours. So I guess I shouldn't say they're all riled up. They're all settled down. But if they don't want to get off that truck, you got to get in there. Somebody has got to get in a confined area with 160 pigs and convince them all to get off of there. And they really can't use much of anything. What can a trucker use today? Uh, a plastic panel. Yeah. So a standard would be a plastic panel of three and a half foot panel. And then it used to be a paddle. Um, but now the USDA, uh, we've seen uh, some, some paddle marks on the, the height of the, the animal as well as throughout into the meat and the carcass when they see them on the line. So even, for example, at JBS, we're going to uh, like a, a gallon bucket or a gallon BB. Uh, Just a shaker. Shaker, yeah, BBs yep. inside of it. So you can't touch the pigs. It's more, you know, we use that same pr- that product in wean pigs. But, yep. you know, wean pigs are skittish. They can move quick. Yeah, so they'll can, run right off. Yeah, so you shake it. That's good. But you get 300-pound market animals there that are a little more challenging. What's, what's harder? Is it loading the pigs onto the truck or getting them off for you as the trucker? Probably well, depends. It's more so getting them off yeah I getting on, you, you you do have that electric prod uses that uh one doesn't harm the animal but it does it does help move things along but also you know you torque it on the head it's a, a different you know there's six months or five months of their life they've been in one facility right now you go to a different facility you you were on a truck you know six five six months ago but now you're on a different truck you're going at night you're scared different facility lit up you got a uh, the employee has a ID hammer that tattoos, it tattoos the hog. So they look into that, you know, it's like, and then they're skittish, right? So um, you're just going in there with, uh, with the BB yeah. jug and it's just, it's not easy, right? Yeah. Um, so you got to keep your calm, keep your cool. And that's another thing is you're trying to get people to come drive. You know, why would you want right. to do that? Right. You yep. know, that, that is, uh, it used to pay. You know, that yep. was, you, you made you made more money on livestock compared to non-life freight, but it, it paid for that extra yep, overhead. that hassle. Yep, but now that non-life freight's coming up, so even right. if it's a washer, it's making more money, well, I there's no sales pitch to keep you, right? right? You know, I don't, if someone says, I'm going to go haul, I'm going to go haul life freight or dry van or reefer or flatbed because it pays the same, well, I, I, at the end of the day, I really don't anymore have a sales pitch to right. keep them here because of that aspect well our whole society we're short on labor everything right. i mean we just yeah. are and that and and holland is is uh right there with it i oh, mean yeah it's like we said before i mean you got to be a tough sob to be able to you know do that yeah. it takes you gotta have some nuts I mean, and our pigs are always hard to load because we do such a good job that our <laughs> pigs love us and they don't ever want to leave yeah they also, get to the door and they're like, no, I don't want to go. One thing I wanted to say about those electric prods, and I think, I mean, Dad, if you watch our TDF YouTube channel, we uh, show loads, we load pigs. And if you watch, we don't use those electric prods as much as, you know, these PETA documentaries want to show you or whatever. And if we do tap a pig, we're not always have our finger on the trigger. Right. Like people always think if you tap a pig with the buzzer, you're got the buzzer hot it's, right it's buzzing them and it's no. not always the case if they're moving good it's just that's kind of thing. a but if i mean they're stuck that's when you got to be like okay we need to figure it out but but just like the trucker side of it the loading side of it we're very lucky in the fact that we've got the people we use to help us load are excellent mm-hmm. um and because it's it's a disposition pigs can sense pigs can sense if you're a if you're just pissed out of your mind and so the calmer you stay the calmer they are and <laughs> and i think for us pre-sorting them helps a lot it oh, just yeah. makes everything go better but um on the truck when you get them to the packer are they're all facing the opposite way right they're all facing that's the other thing because well, yeah you, you walk into that hole and they're scared or the that door and they're going to turn around, right? It's mm-hmm. not like they're just antsy and ready to jump, right? And yeah. isn't the wind like going this way, so they just want to kind of lay down with it, the it, wind? More so in the summer because in that in the, like static press or in your hog barns, you have yeah. fun, so it's going to suck that door. So you will have those fans inside those facilities, those barns. They will they will distribute air, so they'll pull air through that that hog tra- uh, trailer, just like just like uh, ventilation a hog barn, yeah. right? Yeah. So looking forward, when you think about you know lots changed in the time that you've been there. In three or four more years, do you think that as an industry, we will have more owner operators or more company-owned trucks, trailers, and drivers? 
um, I would say uh, owner operators because the, the prideful thing of uh, of owning your own business, but it's also more lucrative. But also with lucrativity is also um, risk, right? You're yeah. your own business, a lot more overhead. But um, you know, it, it pays more money if you want more money. But that's you know, common economics, econ 101, supply and demand. There's a high demand or constant demand to haul pigs and low supply of drivers that needs to drive price, right? right. So, um, we, and we've had to do that along with other people in the industry is, is raise our rates because yeah. of that. Yeah, and, and, and you had a point when you started, like the number of owner operators you have today versus what you had when you started. I mean, it used to be even in an area, it used to be all company guys, right? Because, right. and then also benefits, you know, that's these, these larger companies offer benefits. Um, but now, it's just, we have no benefits, Sawyer, so don't <laughs> sign up for that. Um, so that was another reason. But now it's, it's a large percentage of owner-operators because they get their own business and they make more money. Yeah. Um, but I think short and long term, it, that's the way it's going to be. have to go. Then, you know, also, too, with trucking companies, insurance. Insurance is not cheap, you know. So um, and you got road use tax every April or, sorry, August and um uh, if the tax and there's just a lot yeah. of overhead in that dad the only benefit that i get working here is sometimes good. i get to see you get ran over by a pig and i don't have to yell at you that's a benefit to me oh yeah that's true and yeah, bet it's that's a benefit true. for me for you too if i get ran over you like seeing me get pretty mad well that's i have selfish reasons for that i've said this before the thing that i like when sawyer gets really mad not just mildly pissed but when he gets really mad uh, he looks just like my dad when we used to raise pigs. So it's kind of like, it's kind of nostalgia because I can see Lawrence Whistler read. Mini. Yeah, it's like, it's a giant. Actually, it's a giant <laughs> Lawrence Whistler because my dad was smaller than I was. But yeah, he and he, he sounds just like him. You wouldn't think that a frame that big could put out such a small, squeaky, mad voice when he gets really <laughs> pissed, but he can't. Yeah, um, I'll do it so, so I'll ask you something. Um, do you think that there's any... As it's harder to find drivers, do you think that the industry may get to the point where we may have crews that actually load the pigs completely on the trailer, and then when you get to the plant, that unload them so the drivers aren't doing it just because you can't, you may be able to find people that are willing to drive the truck, but they're not willing to be the guys in there doing all that. That's, that's a challenge too, is there's years ago that, uh, plants were like, you know, we're just going to do this ourselves. And as a driver, that's great because yeah. that we talked about overhead and, you know, smelling like manure, dealing with these pigs and yeah. having USDA watch you, that's that's overhead that's not enjoyable. So the plant's like, we'll just take it over. Well, the challenge with that is they don't want the liability either. You know, let's right. say they hit a pig wrong or or they, uh, they, they do something wrong or harm the pig in a certain way. Um, it's all it on a, them. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that's the toughest there is because, you know, us as farmers – as the ones raising the pigs, we know, we know very well because we've had all our training. We know how to handle the pigs. We know what you should do and what you shouldn't do. But mm -hmm. when you go and hire somebody, and, and the other thing is there used to be an endless supply of farm kids that grew up on a farm just like you, just like us, that had some experience with livestock. But today, when you go hire a driver, you may be hiring somebody that has no experience handling livestock. And so it's one thing to get somebody that can drive a truck and do it in the middle of the night and back up and hit a chute up a shitty gravel lane that some farmer that'll remain nameless didn't put enough rock on. <laughs> could, oh, could it be cost us. me. It could be us. Um, but then you got to rely on them because they're taking the liability for whoever they're hauling those pigs for. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah. I mean that. For somebody that doesn't know. Yeah, that, and you train, I mean, you can sit through as much training as you want to and read it off a thing, but until you're actually in there doing it, it's right. a whole different deal. And then you so, got to be a good, and then, then the farmers get pissed at if you, it pissed at you if you don't load the pigs good and they're like, well, I'm just, you know, they, yeah, it's a lot. You can do all that. We just, all that overhead or just go work for Walmart or Amazon. Well, that's you know, a thing. And, then, and, and that's where it, it's, a, it's a challenge right now, you know, because, yeah. uh, Everything, like I said, I mentioned non-live freights have gone up, or sorry, rates have gone up, but also that's one that's one big variable in my opinion. But the second large one is that just like farming, the average age of a farmer is 58 to 60, right? Well, the average age of a livestock hauler is not far behind that, right? right? So you need turnover on the bottom end to replace those older gentlemen, and mm -hmm. there's not because those young guys are seeing this excess of work and overhead, and they're like, why, why would I want to do that? 
I can if, make this much money or more money than this. If you're out there right now and you're like, man, I want to be a trucker, call Austin Nub, yeah. call Nub Trucking, and they'll set you up and they'll get you hooked up. Well, but don't, hopefully, if you got some experience, we want the experienced ones, but yeah, we need you. Everyone yeah. needs you. It's, it's a need. No, it is. I mean, that's a, it's just like we talked about last time. If you're somebody, if you're a young person and you want to make a living and make a very comfortable living, the number of ways you can do it right now are vast and wide. Mm -hmm. The thing is, they involve labor. Right. The problem is, we've raised a whole generation that think they're going to go get a a finance degree, and they're going to get a job at a bank, and they're going to be a vice president of something, and they're going to make $100,000 off the get-go. And we got plenty of those people, and we got plenty of people that would like to get a check for doing nothing, apparently, because there's plenty of people that want that. And I'd like to do that too, but I, I, I don't know. I don't qualify. I saw something a while back, and it was a, a gentleman was talking. It was Facebook, believe it or not, but it was a video, and they talked about how this generation they wanted immediate satisfaction. Yeah, right? they, they instant want instant gratification. Yep. they want that hundred grand now. You know, they don't want to enjoy the process and learn and do right. the trials and errors and the and the work for it. Um, and I, I would agree with that. Totally. Yeah. And, and, I, and, totally. and I see myself do that, right? I, I read that. I'm like, well, he's right. And then yeah. I, was, I was trucking one night, and I, 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 and I like trucking because I, I spend time in thought. I, yeah. I like the process. And I was I'm like, you know, I, I'm guilty of that. I'll be the first one to say. Right. It's these right here. Yeah. Because it's all right here. It's instant, in- instantaneous. You can find shit on the internet right away. You can see everybody's new how their lives are going instantly, it's it's this. I well, mean, you guys need to get off that because what I was going to say when you were talking about the average age of truckers, if you want to be the next Zeus Nup, shout out to Zeus Nup. You think Austin's a legend. Yeah. Zeus Nup's yeah. a legend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tanner's a legend too. Yeah. We're, they're all they're legends. all They're all pretty, they're all pretty, uh, pretty good at the social arts let's yes. just say that Enjoy but themselves. anyway your what? old man he fits that category oh, what's yeah. what's you know? what's austin's best party you, he's got you're something gonna put me on the spot I, you got it he does this at every party and there's no oh, yeah. else that can do yeah, it as so good as he can what nup has and i think most good truckers are like this but what i love about nup is you can take him to the world pork expo to any bar and uh, he'll be like, let's get some toddies. And he'll get a toddy. He'll get a Crown and Coke tall. And he'll work that entire room. And he'll drink from that glass the whole time. And two hours later, he'll get back to the bar and he's still got the same glass because that CDL is valuable and he doesn't want to become. And I think he likes taking advantage of people because <laughs> he's figured out that as he works the room, everybody else, they're their sensibilities and, and abilities get lower, but yet Nup stays <laughs> razor sharp. So he just, he just, he takes advantage. He's a smart, he's a smart cookie. I am. I, well, <laughs> I'm a truck driver. Don't, yeah. Well, that we means you're borderline we're, genius. Yeah, we claim we're smart, but sometimes <laughs> we're a few bricks short of a shit house. Okay. <laughs> well, we've made, we've made pretty good rounds yeah, on here. So for sure. we'll ask you a bonus question. And this is, this is, this can be as, this can be as uh, politically generous or as snarky as you want. Mm-hmm. So, what is the best? What is the best brand and model of semi out there today? You know, um, I was raised uh, from the beginning with a Kenworth. Uh, that's what all my family, yep. all four of my my two brothers and my dad. That's our personal trucks, Kenworth. Um, dad is as he's gotten older he's also gotten wiser so fuel economy kind of goes a little more up his uh totem pole so he has an aerodynamic uh kenworth t660 yeah um, where my brothers and i have w9s yep. so uh, it's more the flashy the lights um you always want to make sure you're inside the barn before a nup truck shows up because you'll get smoked with those bright lights if you don't get out of the way. Yeah, there is a lot of lights. You'd swear it was Christmas in July. (laughs) I thought you were going to say you just want to be out of the way because when they come in, it's like guns blazing. They don't don't slow down for anything. Uh, But back in the day when when your dad first started, when he got his first, did he start with a cab over? He started with straight trucks, transitioned to cab overs, then transitioned. So the cab overs, were those Peterbilt's? Uh, most of them were Peterbilt's. Yeah. yeah. We have, so he bought, uh, we have the 89. 
You got ago. it back, didn't we got you? It back. Yeah, we got the 89 back. And then we also got, um, that's an 89 Peterbilt 352. And yep. then we got the Kenworth K1, KW100. That's a uh, burnt orange. That <laughs> That'll make you appreciate what you drive today. Yep, you're exactly right. So when I was a kid, I had a good friend of mine that moved from Washington, Iowa to Perry, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And in the summertime, I would ride, I would go see him once in a while, and we'd go to Adventureland. And I'd ride with Harry Walker in that cat, one of those cab overs from the buying station in Washington to the plant in Perry. Tyson, yep. And I was probably only like 10 or 12 and Harry looked kind of like Bigfoot to me, you know, <laughs> back then. But, well, he kind of looks like Bigfoot now a little yeah. bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember being little and thinking, you know, this thing sure does kind of kind of bob a lot. And I've all, often thought that, man, that that would work a guy Oh yeah, back well, in the day. Back, a lot of them were spring ride, right? Yeah. You know, so spring ride, and then where you sit, you sit right on the axle, right? Oh. So every bump you hit, you feel from your toes to your ears. Oh, man. So... Uh, but you're right. I mean, it's it is a huge pride thing when you do it. But one day a week or one load a week or whatever, it's pretty neat. But yeah, every day on a day, I, there ain't no way I'd want to do it. Absolutely not. Favorite trucker snack? You go, you're hitting the gas station. You uh, got to get one snack. What the hell? What's gonna keep you up at night? Bang the bang, the old bang energy drinks. Those oh, are those are okay. those are absolutely a necessity. <laughs> yep. Slim Jims. You hit no. the Slim Jims. I'm a snack guy, so I'll get like the sour gummy worms or a snick or uh, not Snickers, uh, Twizzlers or something of that nature. There you go. That and sounds bang. like bad. Mm -hmm. Dad likes the dots. I don't know yeah. what the hell's wrong with you. If I go to the yeah. movie, I gotta have a box of dots. That's dots. the only time I eat it. And I don't drink pop anymore. I I haven't drank pop in I don't know how long unless I go to the movie. If I go to the movie, I gotta have dots and I gotta have a big Mountain Dew with lots of ice. And mm -hmm. then I come home and I can't sleep. Can't sleep. I just up. stay up all night. I guess I should get a truck. I sh <laughs> yeah, I should. <laughs> New Makes employer. Right you get hard, yeah. If you get hard up enough, I might be able to haul one load a week. A week. See if we could work something Never out. Never know. Never know. Stranger things have happened. Absolutely. Okay, well, Nup has got a lot of things to do. He's a busy, busy man. He's a busy his, guy. His phone's been going off. He's 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 got a lot of people to talk to. Hopefully think, good news, but probably not. <laughs> <laughs> probably not. <laughs> Well, we thank you for coming. We appreciate it. And I hope that I hope that you all got some value out of this because this is the this is one of those conversations that there's just a lot of stuff that you don't realize everything that goes in to um, feeding the world. Yeah, because at the end of the day, um, when we put these pigs in, every pig you put in, you got to take out. And we didn't even touch on this, but you know. Uh, how many loads of feed is there in a group of pigs? I had that written down. I can't remember oh, how many shit. semi loads of pit or how many semi loads of feed it takes. So not only are are you trucking the pigs in, trucking the pigs out, but you got to get all that feed, and it takes it takes an army. It takes mm -hmm. an army to make the food, um, and this is just on the pork side. This is why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, so we should disconnected. We should probably give mad props to anybody that's trucking produce, meat, anything, livestock, because yeah. without it, our society would cease to function pretty quick. So, I'll leave you with that thought. Um, we appreciate every one of you, and we appreciate the comments, and we hope that you know you got value from this. And if you did, we just ask that. You know, you would share this out to your friends. Um, follow us on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram. Follow us on TikTok. I'm not really on the TikTok much, uh, other than when Sawyer's nice enough to cut up the clips. He does all the work on the clips, so yeah. I don't have anything to do with that. Yeah, leave us a rating. Leave us a review. Um, that's that's what could help us out the most, guys. So we really appreciate you guys watching or listening. Austin, thanks again for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Keep trucking. Keep on trucking. Thank you very much.